In the film Eight and a Half, while the protagonist Guido is in bed with his lover, a mysterious character appears on one side of the room, seemingly wiping a surface that does not exist with a cloth. This character is Guido's mother, who leads Guido to another level of the story, out of reality and into a dream. The place of reality where Guido falls asleep is the hotel room where he is in bed with his lover, and the dreamlike place he transfers to is a cemetery, more precisely, the mausoleum where his father rests. The examples are countless. In addition to this scene, we can see, for example, Guido waking up at the beginning of the film from a dream in a medical studio surrounded by doctors. But even more impressive and revealing of Guido's psychology, in the scene at the bar, we see the world around him transform seamlessly, remaining motionless in his chair with just an act of his imagination. Guido transforms the real situation in which his wife is furious about the arrival of her lover into a fantastic situation where the two women meet and become friends. The film is full of these passages between different levels, from reality to fantasy, from dream to lies, from presence to escape. Fellini's cinematographic style lacks narrative linearity, which demands and produces this multidimensionality. Guido moves from one dimension to another, as if he were leaving one room and entering another, mainly with the aim of chasing some fantasy or escaping some responsibility. Guido, and Fellini with him, is playing a game that is too complex for the other characters, a game in which others can only follow him to a certain extent, a game similar to the tri-dimensional chess game in Star Trek, whose rules are clear to the actors on stage, but difficult to interpret for television viewers. Of course, in cinema, the idea of transition is linked to the passage from one scene to another. Can we consider the scenes of a film as if they were different rooms of an apartment? The epitome of the idea of film editing in the history of cinema is reached by Alfred Hitchcock in the shower scene in Psycho, where in a few seconds the editing proposes a large number of cuts and scene transitions. The idea of a cut is perhaps ironically used by Hitchcock here as a metaphor for the knife attacking the actress. What is Hitchcock's intention in this furious succession of image changes? He probably wants to create a sense of confusion in the viewer, to make him feel helpless, to reproduce a situation in which a traumatic event disrupts the perceptual abilities of the victim. What is, in fact, the minimum level of perception that allows one to understand an image before falling into pure paranoia and regressive passivity? When we look at a painting or a photograph, or generally at a static image, we can think of two different types of gaze, an immediate synoptic gaze and a linear gaze that travels through the image one detail at a time as if it were a labyrinth or, to speak in mathematical terms, a pay a no surface. For each of these two gaze operations, the synoptic and the diachronic one, a minimum time is necessary for focusing in one case and for the eye's journey through the image in the other, a time that in the case of fixed images can be managed by the viewer and is instead completely managed by the director in cinema. It is the director who decides how much time to assign to focus and to the eye's journey through the image, who decides whether to give the viewer time to assimilate the image or not. The viewer might feel like Lori Jupiter in The Watchman when she is transported too quickly from one dimension to another by oh, Dr. Manhattan. Damn. An example of slowness of perception offered to the viewer can be found in Dutch painting of the 17th century, where liminal spaces, doors, and corridors become protagonists in the representation of anonymous domestic spaces populated by common people, a sign of a changing way of living in this society and century beginning to create the shell of individual space, a protected space where individuals can be at peace with themselves, where they can perhaps even get bored, 
protected from the plethora of symbols that afflict the religious representation of events and spaces in the pictorial productions of previous epochs. The painter's gaze investigates with a certain delicate voyeurism and discovers people reading a letter behind a door, waiting for something at the end of a corridor. In contemporary art, a work like Bruce Nauman's Green Corridor monumentalizes a liminal space lit by green light. The viewer may wonder whether to cross it or not. Is it an obstacle or a passageway? Is it a wall or a bridge? One of the most terrifying scenes in the history of cinema is the hallway scene in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, perhaps because it mixes the idea of the hallway as a play space for the child who rides his tricycle on it, and the idea of a maze infested with evil presences, a maze that recurs more extremely again at the end of the film, the hotel corridor in The Shining, a track for the child's tricycle races, and also the passage to a terrifying unknown world, presents an experience similar to that of a normal family's child who hears a noise at night, wakes up, crosses the corridor and opens the door to the parents' room to see something he doesn't understand. This is what psychoanalysts call Ursain, the primary scene, a sort of fundamental primordial perception of the mystery of human life that conditions, from when it occurs, the very act of perception and is fundamental to analyze both static and cinematic images. Stanley Kubrick also shows us a passageway in the scene of the astronaut's temporal space journey in 2001, a space odyssey. What is at the end of that hallway full of lights, an end or a beginning? Or in some paradoxical way, do the end and the beginning coincide and the hallway leads us back to the same room? In a more everyday way, George Lucas in American Graffiti shows us a failed attempt at a rite of passage when he portrays a teenager trying to buy a bottle of alcohol, even though he is not old enough to do so at a drugstore in a small American town. Rites of passage can succeed or fail. One can manage to get to the other side of the hallway or become stuck in the liminal space, on the threshold of a door, or be rejected, as in a temporal glitch. Let's try to think of the white spaces between words, commas, periods, dashes, quotation marks, as a liminal threshold that exists between words, as an articulation that allows us to construct meaning. Let's think of the almost invisible space of cinematic transition, the space between two images, between two scenes, between two sequences, which constitutes the syntax of storytelling. Even if we are sure or believe that we understand the meaning of what we see, the cinematic liminal space remains an enigmatic and mysterious space that we can only interpret post hoc. Our understanding is only constructed afterwards, as demonstrated by the Kuleshov effect montage experiment, where the expression of a man, edited in sequence with different images, expresses completely different meanings, such as hunger, mourning, desire. We read the expression of the man, which is always exactly the same, in a completely different way depending on the images with which it is associated, a bit like in Lautriamont's idea of the association of an umbrella and a sewing machine on a surgeon's table. Fellini's cinematic editing, in addition to constituting a particular narrative technique in his non-linear cinematic construction, also has the value of representing an interrupted and cut symbolic space, supported by parallel and transversal planes that bear different worlds, sometimes communicating, sometimes not. At the same time that Fellini shows us this labyrinth of worlds similar to an Escher image, he provides us with access to this complexity, but also signals that his film's characters cannot make these jumps, which are allowed only to the protagonist and his alter ego, the director himself. A final question we can ask ourselves is, Therefore, how many planes of our imagination, our real life, our dream world, are we aware of? How many of these planes are we able to show to others in our creative activity? Senti, papà. Avevo tante domande da farti.